Sorry about that one. Livening up a little bit.
many of you are suffering from hockey lag? Okay, you should be. If not, you better watch the game Monday. So uh, hopefully we can finish it up on Monday. Just a couple of things. Uh, last week we focused in on um, our missionary, Pastor Dauman. This week we're going to be looking at Lutheran Bible translators. And then next week will be LWML as we take a look at... Uh, sharing the, the faith in these special ways. And with that, I invite you to turn to your first hymn, Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying, verses 1, 2, and 4. Verses 1, 2, and 4. And just a reminder, people are starting to take their masks off right here. When they're off. Please don't do that. We want you to, to grab this without any breathing on this. Uh, take your mask off when you go over there right we're, we're not in a rush, 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 but if you could please uh, leave your mask on until to, to you're over here. Thank you.
of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. comes from 2 Kings chapter 22, beginning with verse 3. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, the son of Aziliah, the son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work in the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have been paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord, have been entrusted it to the workers who supervise. And Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. 
He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, the Hakkiah, son of Shaphan, Echabor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Ashiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judea about what is written in this book and has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, our Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. may be seated at this time as we continue with thy strong word verses 1, 3, and 4. Jesus Christ, amen. Hear these words from our reading. 
Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in, from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to take a look at this text here. And we see some interesting things here. In fact, we might say that they're sort of ironic here. Um, and we might even say they're somewhat facetious, laughable, except for the consequences are very serious here. Did you catch it? Let's recap. King Josiah has ordered the repair, the refurbishing of the temple. That has actually been going on for about 100 years. It's all going well, and then a report comes back to the king there in verse 10. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilakiah the priest has given me a book. You get it? You get what's going on here? Solomon's temple. Think about that magnificent structure. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built for just one purpose. And what was it built for? It was built for worship. Every day, the priest would offer the lamb for the morning and evening sacrifices. Every day, the people of Judah would bring their own sacrifices and present their firstborn and give their offerings. And year after year, the high priest would go and make that treacherous run into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. Passover celebrations, although they weren't as regular as they should be, were still going on. Basically, what we see going on here is a whole lot of religion there in the temple. But suddenly, Suddenly, after a century of overdue fix-ups, what do we have here? They come across a book. A book, imagine that. Apparently, the king doesn't know anything about this book. In fact, he didn't know it was missing. Well, the king, by the way, we found a book. It just happened to be the book. The book of the law. The book of the covenant that God gave to his people through Moses 800 years before. So about a century, it appears, they've been functioning. Doing all of these religious things without the book. And it seems like they're doing just fine. Well, of course not. They're not doing just fine. Imagine a building without the book. Imagine that, a building without the book. And you know what would happen? Well, the building without the book would quickly fill up with our own imagination or our own human illusion. No, the people of Judah hadn't been doing very well. They've been sacrificing lambs. They've been bringing their offerings before their firstborn, morning and evening. They've been going through all of the other motions. But they're doing some other things, too. They had altars in that temple to the stars. And they believed those stars represented certain gods. God's like to help them. And not only that, they emptied that temple and took the valuable things and sold them so they could build some foreign alliances. And what happens? Things got even worse. They took up the practice of the Canaanites. And they went and they sacrificed their own children. God had been very explicit in Jeremiah. 32 about this. I had not commanded this abomination, nor had it entered my mind. Without the book, all of these hideous things 
we're going on. Now let's take a little look at today. Without the book, imagine how we fill the building. A beautiful cathedral, a towering Gothic building. But what do we add to its superstitious relics? We try to sell forgiveness. We do all kinds of things that are wrong. Make up all kinds of rules that are wrong. False faith. That's what happens without the book. A false faith that is there just to be purchased. Without the book, we can take a look at these more dated sanctuaries of the 50s, the 60s, and 70s and just talk about the love of God. That's really what's happening today. Without maintaining His holiness and the other things He's given to us. Just make sure everything's warm and nice. Tell everybody that God really wouldn't punish sin. To fill it in place with the inclusiveness of God. We'd fill it as a place without repentance. We fill it with supposed care for women without any care for babies. Not relying on God's teaching of the sanctity of life. We'd have a total lack of familiarity with who God really is. We talk about things like ages of accountability instead of infant baptism. God sealing that child as a child of God and giving that child faith. Well, if you take a look around the world, especially as we look at Lutheran, Lutheran Bible Translator Sunday here, we see there's active religion going on. There's Christians celebrating the Lord's Day. There's Jewish Sabbaths being, being recognized. And every Muslim is there at the hour of prayer on their knees. A lot of religion going on. But so much of it is without the book. Just human imagination. Human illusions about God. In many places, that's because the book is not available in their local language. In many parts of the world, missionaries have to go out. And they have to do a little bit of translation and bring the message in the local language. They plant Christian churches in different areas, but it's greatly hindered by the lack of of having the book, the Word of God, in the local language. Familiar language. These people can hear it on Sunday, and they can take that to heart. But they can't go home and read their Bibles. Like you have at home, those books with the dust on them. They can't do that. And even more of those words that the missionary speaks as he preaches can be very precious to them, but they still don't have their own Bibles. And not only that, when their own people are trained to be pastors, those pastors confess to the teachings of the Lutheran faith, but many of those pastors don't even have their own book, the Word of God, in their own language to confirm all of that, that all of this really came from Scripture. They just don't have it. Let me quote from the uh, missiologist Dr. Kwame Bidako of Ghana. West, uh, he has said, no language community should be considered reached until they have the scriptures available in the mother tongue as a foundation for building sustainable Christian thought, life, and community. The building without the book would very quickly fill up with our own imagination, our own human illusions about God. And that's, of course, not just saying about the book, no building would be empty with the Word of God itself. In fact, that would be saying more than it'd be empty of the Word of God, 
It would be empty of the incarnate Christ. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Christ would not be there. God's people without the book would be wandering from the Lord. We read about that here today. Great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of the book to do according to all that was written concerning us. So in verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book, the, the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. He wasn't tearing his clothes out of despair. Why was he tearing his clothes? Because he recognized what was going on there in the temple. He recognized what's going on with the people was beside the book. It was their own human illusions about God, their own imagination as they brought in these false gods, altars to the stars, taking up the practice of the Canaanites and sacrificing their own children. And we see the word of God touching Josiah as he tears his clothes. But there's more. Not just the law coming to Josiah. But that Josiah could still hear about that seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3. The promise of our Savior Jesus Christ. He could also hear about that lion of Judah in Genesis chapter 49 pointing to Jesus Christ. He could also hear about Deuteronomy 18, the one like the prophet Moses, our Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the whole Bible is nothing but a book about Christ. The book that actually gives us deliverance. The book that actually shows us who Christ is. And if when we realize we have Christ, we don't have to imagine anything. We know why Jesus Christ is here, that he judges sin, but we can also be familiar with the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that not only was sin judged, but sin was overcome because our Lord showed his mercy and Jesus paid for that mercy. You can be sure of forgiveness. And all those sinful imaginations that have filled our churches can go away. And we can see what true religion looks like. And see that we have the incarnate Word of God, our Savior Jesus Christ. We can be certainly certain that baptism and the Lord's Supper and all of these things have meaning and bring the forgiveness of sins for all of us. But we have the book, but it's also important for us to give the book. You have it inside of your bulletin there, an insert on Lutheran Bible Translators, a way that you can very simply give. But also on the back you have uh, the Erslings. Michael Ersling is a Bible translator and uh, um, he's, we've been supporting him for some years. And also this book, there's only a few out there, called The Messenger, and they had something very interesting in here I want to share with you. It says, one such place is the Ethiopian Evangelical Church, the Canaanesis, the largest Lutheran church in the world, with 9.3 million members. This month, assisted by the Lutheran Bible translators, the first class of the Canaanesis Cemetery, our seminary, will conclude its initial year of an innovative Bachelor of Theology program, training seminarians in biblical languages and Bible translating skills. They're training their own people in this. It's gratifying to see those early seeds take root and begin to bear fruit. This is what Lutheran Bible translators do. They allow book, the book, to go in buildings especially buildings in the language that people can hear. Think about that. With the book and helping the Lutheran Bible translators, you're actually giving the who has been given to you an eternal 
salvation. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Word of God Himself. In the name of Jesus. service continues now uh, with our prayers. There are a number of uh, prayers that are not printed in the bulletin there for you that I need to add. Uh, take note, though, in the bulletin prayers that we have uh, cancer treatments for Mary Lou Nash. Uh, Mary Lou, I haven't talked to her in a while, but she is uh, one of our Emanuel Lutheran Church's founding members uh, 50 years ago. We have uh, healing also from COVID for Ronnie and Martha. And then in addition to that, um, one of our own people who uh, contributed to the music here, started the tone chimes, uh, brought violence in here to share God's word. Gene Hart passed away this past weekend. Also, two car accidents, one for um, healing for Kayla Westbrook, daughter and friend of a friend of Kim Stromberg, and Diana Bearden, uh, who had an accident just the other day, a friend of Kathy. So with that, I invite you to bow your heads and your hearts as we go to our Lord. O oh Lord, we are your people, chosen by your grace to be your own possession, and granted mercy upon mercy. Hear your people who cry to you in need. And remember us according to our favor that you have shown us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Make us to know your ways, O oh Lord, that we who may walk in the paths of salvation made known for us in the book, in your word. Hear our complaints and quiet them by your merciful deliverance, that we may respond with trust and thanksgiving. Lord, shine your light upon us, that we do what is good and right and live as faithful citizens in our nation. Bless those who govern us, all those who are elected and appointed, to make and administer and judge our laws. Enlighten us, Lord, with godly wisdom. Bless those who pursue science to improve our lives and the lives of those in greatest need. Bless all honorable vocations and honest labor, and lead the unemployed to good jobs and noble work, not only for their own interests, but for the good of us. Lord, we also ask you to show compassion on those, O oh Lord, and in your mercy grant healing, comfort and peace to all those who suffer. Deliver them from all their afflictions, pain, and sorrow. We especially pray for the family of Jean Hart. Lord, Jean was so faithful. She read that word of God daily to the very end. Continue to be with her and her, her, be with her family and comfort them with the joy of knowing because he lives, we shall live also. Lord, be with Kayla and Diana, both who have gone through accidents. Lord, bring them comfort and uh, endurance in their time of healing. Be with Mary Lou Nash, one of our founders, who is undergoing cancer treatments. And be with Ronnie and Martha as they are suffering from COVID. Lord, we pray also for all those we name in our hearts before you. Unite us, O oh Lord that we may be of one mind, of one will and doctrine, witness and service. Bless us as we come to your bidding to receive the body and blood of your Son at his table. Grant that we receive this Holy Communion, we may keep it holy in our hearts with our holy lives. Grant to us all good things, needful for this body and life, and profitable for our salvation. And keep us from all things harmful that sustain in time of want, guard in time of prosperity, that we may endure to the day of our Lord's coming and be judged worthy of eternal life. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join together now in prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father,
Christ on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. 